My name is Tom Fontana from the Ohio Soybean Council. On behalf of the soybean farmers of the state of Ohio and uh, our education platform called Grow Next Gen, which is out there for teachers and students to use all around the state, uh, we welcome you to this Harvest Farm Tour. I want to uh, introduce you to Scott Metzger from Metzger Farms in Ross County. Ohio. Uh, Scott is going to be taking you through the tour today. We're going to be talking about any number of issues. And uh, unfortunately, Scott uh, uh, has run into some equipment issues and his combine is not cooperating at the minute at the time at this time. But uh, we still have uh, ways to show you what goes on the farm and Scott will be talking uh, about what he does. So with that, let's get started. Okay, thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. Uh, like Tom said, uh, my name is Scott Metzger. I'm a sixth generation grain farmer from uh, South Central Ohio. Uh, we're located about 45 minutes um, south of Columbus, straight south. And uh, like Tom said, uh, I'm, actually, I, I'm actually shelling corn today. And uh, we've got, got all of our beans cut, so, so we've switched over and are shelling corn. And I've had a, had a breakdown on my header that we're actually working on at the moment here. So that's, it's, it's pretty quiet right now. And <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just sitting in the cab of the combine at the moment. Well, Scott, why don't you go through uh, kind of the gross stages of a, of a soybean, um, telling them how you... Uh, started with this year's crop and and the different phases and uh where you are right now okay yeah we can do that so um with with soybeans uh they're they're planted in the in the springtime um down in our area we we usually plant anywhere from uh starting on april 20th um clear up to the first crop soybeans you know we like to have those done at least by the by the end of may um, in our operation, we uh, we actually no-till all of our soybeans, so so we we don't disturb any of the ground. We just we just go out and plant um, in into the corn stalks, as you can uh, see in this picture here uh, on the left-hand side. Those are those are soybeans that were that were no-tilled and and uh, probably anywhere from from three to five days to to two weeks, depending on the weather and how warm it is. Uh, you'll get your your soybeans will sprout, or you see the see the little white cod leading or a, a sprout coming off of it, um, and and a lot of that will depend on the depend on the moisture and depend on the weather. Obviously, the warmer it is, uh, the the quicker that takes place. If you're if you're doing it in April, um, you know in the middle part of April, usually your soils are cooler and it it takes you know a lot of times it'll take two weeks for them to for them to actually come up out of the ground like how they are there on the on the right hand side of the picture. And as as, as we go through the go through the growing season, um, you know that the uh, first first couple couple weeks that's what they the beans will look like coming up out of the ground where the where the cod leadings come up and 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 actually spread. Um, that's where you that's where you start to get your growth at and and uh as the as the days get longer the the soybeans will start start growing more you get more heat and 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 more um you, you need rain to make obviously everything to grow as the as the summer progresses on uh you get into that middle of june to late june time frame and that's that's where your soybeans will they'll start um they'll start uh blooming which is what the purple um purple picture is there on the soybean plant and and during this time that's that's when um prior prior to that right in around that time frame is usually when we start when we make our chemical application uh for for weed control in the field um it's usually usually about 22 to 22 to 25 days after we after we plant the soybeans we'll we'll go back in and uh spray to control control any sort of weeds we have out there a uh, couple couple of the biggest weed issues in our area is is um or is johnson or i mean um <laughs> mare's tail 
and uh, giant ragweed. So those are those are usually the usually the weeds that that we're going after the most. Occasionally you'll have some different type of grasses and stuff out there. Uh, then as you get into the later end of the summer, in that in the early early July, mid July, um, the soybeans will actually start potting, which is which is uh, what what that picture is there. Um, uh, typically you'll have uh, three to four beans uh, per pod. Occasionally you'll have a occasionally you have a five bean one, um, and it, at this time of this year, this is when you when you really start to worry about your um, diseases coming in um, and bugs uh, eating on them, eating on the pods, eating on the leaves. Um, some bugs such as aphids um, and and other other various diseases that will come in at that at that time when the beans are podding, they're usually uh, anywhere from three to four feet tall, um, and that's and if you if we do have a do have a uh, any sort of disease outbreak or or bug issue, that's that's the time frame when you spray your uh, in, uh, fungicide and insecticide on them to uh, to help to help control any disease issues you have and and help maintain the quality of the soybeans and the and the potential yields you have, um, and that. <clears throat> the, the next picture here is this would be more towards in the fall um, in that if usually middle set middle of September first part of October um, middle of September you'll start the, the leaves on the soybeans will start turning yellow and uh, that's when that's when you know the beans are just about fully mature and uh, the, actually the the leaves will go ahead and completely turn yellow and just fall off and that's that's what you have uh, that uh, the last picture there with the soybean pods. That's what it that's what it looks like when they're ready to combine. So uh, you know the growing season for beans is anywhere from middle of April to the to the to the beginning of September, uh, first part of October. Nor normally by that time uh, they've turned and and they'll be ready for harvest. And uh, when you uh, harvest some soybeans, you know we we want to be in that um 12 and a half to to 15 percent range uh dry it to elevators 13 and a half so anytime you're hauling anything in over 13 and a half percent moisture they they take some shrink off of it so you you actually lose a little bit a little bit of bushels there on them on what you're hauling in and getting paid for well scott we actually have uh a few questions for you already thank you to our <laughs> participants Okay. Uh, uh, the first question is, what variety of soybeans are you planting? So we, uh, in our in our operation, we plant uh, mainly Pioneer and Decalb. Um, we we have uh, this this year. We actually did have some uh, non-GMO beans that uh, went to a facility um, just about a, about forty minutes west of here that uh, that actually end up in Japan. Um, but but for the most part, mostly mostly pioneer and um, and as as grow beans, decal beans, and they they've got a maturity range of of anywhere from from three two to three nine is the the maturity range that we uh, we most generally raise. Okay. Uh, next question: Are the weed killers, fungicide, and pesticide chemicals that you use dangerous to the environment? Are there multiple ones to choose from to be more environmentally friendly? Uh, yes, there are there are several several that uh, several options out there, and um, no, they're they're not dangerous to the environment. Uh, they've 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 been tested uh, numerous times, and the the um, there there's no issue with them. I, I I guess I always tell everybody I wouldn't. I wouldn't spray a product on on any of our crop that that I felt would would harm harm any, any of my kids or any of, or any or anyone else for that fact. Um, so so no, there's there's no issues with with that part of it, and and it's it's a it is a very minute amount that that uh, actually gets sprayed. Uh, most of the most of the most of the rates that we have are anywhere from from twelve to to uh, 18 ounces an acre, so it'd be basically like taking a taking a can of pop and and uh, 
uh, spreading it across the spreading it across the football field. Uh, you're you, you use water as a carrier, so you know there's there's just not it's there's not a lot of the product that gets that gets used out there on it. Okay, uh, can you uh, explain maybe why you uh, rotate your crops? uh corn and soybeans and yeah so if you yeah. use that if you use other crops uh in there too and maybe uh you know how nitrogen plays a role in that uh yeah so in, in our operation we actually we raise corn soybeans wheat and malt and barley um we uh our, our soybeans always get planted um after our corn crop and like I said, no-tilled into that. And then our, our corn uh, usually follows our, our soybean and, and uh, malt and barley and, and wheat. And then uh, when we sow wheat in the fall, it, it gets planted in the bean stubble. And then what, what was the other question you had, Tom? About, about nitrogen. Oh, yeah. So, soybeans so, so, and corn use of nitrogen. Yeah, so with soybeans, you actually, you actually get a they, – they actually fix nitrogen. And we'll put nitrogen in the ground. It's uh, everybody. It's somewhere between twenty to twenty to thirty pounds. What it'll what it'll put in the in the ground as it grows throughout the year um, from the soybeans. So so that helps that helps your corn crop the following year or the or the wheat depending on you know which which way we're going with it. Okay. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the process of harvesting, if we can. What uh, what all is involved, and how you do it, and uh, maybe some of the technology involved. Going through the field, that's that's how you cut the soybeans there, and it, it goes in the machine and and separates it out. And um, I, I guess in our operation is, is similar to how this one here is in the video. We we utilize grain carts and semis, so um, we actually will unload the combine while it's while it's running onto a onto a grain cart and uh then the then the grain cart will take it over to our semis and and from that point it either it either will go to our grain bins and um be stored in there to to be to be hauled in at a later time or it'll be uh, directly taken to the elevator and sold so how many uh how many acres a day can you harvest? Uh, you know, in a good day, we can we can we can cut 175 to to 200 acres, um, depending on how big the big the fields are and how often we have to move. Um, but that's yeah, a, a, a typical day's. I guess a typical day would be 150 acres. Um, okay. That's that's pretty attainable. We the the header we have is 40 foot wide. Um, so it, you know, you can you take a pretty good swath through the field every round. And how how many bushels to the acre of soybeans do you harvest? So usually, uh, well, we we usually plant. We usually have anywhere from we usually raise anywhere from twelve to fifteen hundred acres, uh, depending on how the crop rotation falls, you know, year to year. Um, and and we you know we like to be in that we like to be in that fifty five to to 65 bushel per acre uh, range, but you you take a year like this where we were so incredibly wet early, and then uh, you know as stuff was planted a little bit later. I mean, we were fortunate down this area that the one we got everything planted that we we wanted to plant, and uh, wasn't wasn't quite as late as some of the areas in in the north northern part of the state, but. Um, you know, this this year we're we're looking at we'll probably be in the average somewhere of 47 to 48 bushel per acre um, for our soybean crops. So it's you know it's a, it's 10 to 10 to 20 percent less than what we're used to, but um, still fortunate for the for the year we've had and all the all the various weather events from being super wet early and then uh, from the middle of August through the middle of September. You know, we were we were pretty hot and dry with you know very little rain and that that's the and like i said earlier when the when the beans were uh making pods and stuff you know this year with the the crop being planted later it was it was actually more towards the end of end of july first part of august when we started seeing those pods show up and 
and uh, in, during that time when when pod fills occurs, when you you know you you need to get some rains on the soybeans, and and we pretty much just didn't get them this year. So, um, you know, you look at the when when we were combining the soybeans, uh, you know, you get out and look and and or even scout them ahead of time, and a lot of times there'd be three or four potential beans per pod but once you grab the hold of the pod there may only be two beans and a four four bean pod and just the other the other two beans either never developed or or were you know so small that it really didn't make any you know difference on anything oh very good so i have a question and then we'll get back to uh how a combine actually works, but uh, do you have any idea how many tons of soybeans you will harvest this fall, or how many tons per acre, if you know that? Uh, not off the top of my head, I I wouldn't be able to to do that math that quick. But but I would, uh, you know, we'll we'll have somewhere we'll have somewhere around. Uh, we had almost. 1450 acres this year so whatever that number is times i guess this times 50 for easy math that'd be how many total bushels we raised this year on it but yeah, i don't see that i guess if you multiply that number by 60 and divide it by 2000 you'd be able to come up with a ton okay i i just uh i just roughly did it based on 50 bushels to the acre 1500 acres 60 pounds per bushel that's 4.5 million pounds. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's, by, a, that's a good yeah, question. <laughs> I've never... And we get uh, over 2,000 tons of soybeans. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I've never, I guess I don't think of it that, <laughs> that way on the tons. That's, that's a good question. Okay. Well, uh, let's, uh, if we can... Uh, Let's talk about uh, how a uh, combine works. We have a short illustrated video here uh, to show uh, the classrooms uh, the process of harvesting uh, soybeans with a combine. <clears throat> All so combines must perform three vital tasks to effectively harvest a grain crop, feeding, processing, and cleaning. The feeding system works by gathering the crop from the field and delivering it into the combine. The head gathers the crop by stripping, cutting, or picking it up off the ground. Different heads must be used for different types of crops. Once gathered, the feeder house receives the crop from the head and moves it to the processor for threshing and separating. All combines have a processor, generally a cylinder or rotor, designed to gently remove or thresh the grain from the plant. The rotor rotates in one direction, processing the crop material. As the material moves through the rotor, it rubs across a metal grate or concave. The rubbing action removes the grain from the plant material. The grain, and some small material other than grain, known as mog, falls through the concave, where it's permanently separated from larger plant material. The larger straw and mog moves toward the rear of the machine for discharge. After the crop is threshed and separated, gravity causes the heavier materials, like grain, to continue to fall through the cleaning shoe. The chaffer and sieve move back and forth to separate the grain from the mog. This action ensures that the material is always moving. Once the grain is clean, it moves to the grain handling system for storage and transfer. The grain remains in the grain tank until it's offloaded using the unloading auger, which swings out from the combine over a grain truck. Well, oh, very good. Um, Scott, if you could just take a a brief time and maybe talk a little bit about the technology that, that you use to combine and so forth. Uh, yes, I can, I can do that. 
Um, so, in, <clears throat> so in our in our in our combine here, we um, the, the the one the monitor right here on the bottom, which it's obviously not on right now. That that pretty well is what controls and runs the combine um, from the. It, it, it monitors everything on it. And then um, we also use an iPad to record all of our data as we're going through the field. And that, that's, that's what we keep our records on. We actually use that for planting, spraying, harvesting. And then um, these are all the, the various controls. Um, this, this is called the hydrostat here, and that's actually what makes the, makes the combine go forwards and backwards. And then the various buttons on it control the control the header and stuff and um, uh, various other controls to start and stop the header and adjust everything on it but that's 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 pretty much how our how our combine is set up and then um, here's a here's a picture of the of the grain tank that the the crop actually goes into that's that's corn in there and it's probably uh, it's probably a quarter full it holds holds approximately 200 and 250 to 275 bushels, uh, depending on how full I fill it up. Okay, so now that we've gone through combining, uh, you collect your grain and where does it go from there? Uh, so, so all of our grain, um, we, uh, we most generally uh, store most of our grain. We don't haul a whole, whole lot in the fall. Um, just just it's easier and uh and makes 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 harvest makes harvest go smoother for us less less downtime with the combine um but we we store ours in in grain bins which are similar to what's what's being shown there on the on the uh video screen um and and then from that point on um once we decide to start to start selling some or to to fill some contracts uh we will pretty we we haul pretty much year round um, out of the bins, but they'll they'll go from there to to an elevator. Uh, we've got two or three, uh, four elevator facilities that are that are within twenty to thirty miles from us, and that's that's where all of our beans will go. And from um, from from that point on, uh, that and that's a, that's a picture that would be unloading out an elevator there. Um, from from that point on, they. They will um, most generally go by rail from the elevator to um, usually to either if it's if it's staying in the U.S. they'll go to to feed mills down in down in the southern southern part of the United States and be um, used for uh, chicken feed and various other feeds and, and and other uses and then if they're if they're going overseas they'll go by rail to the to the uh, like down to the high river and then go out on barges uh, and go to their go to their destination then do uh dan do we want to show uh what happens when soybeans go to an elevator do we want to do that now <clears throat> so this this process here is is uh this would be you taking taking your truck to the elevator and uh that's that's called a, a pit that it dumps down into and and your beans will go uh from there into the the elevator the the grain leg when it when it starts up and it'll feed from the from the pit to the to the grain leg and um and and then from that point on it it goes from the grain leg into your into the grain bins Yeah, I guess we're seeing the conveyor system now. Yeah, so it goes up the conveyor system and then goes through a set of tubes depending on, you know, where you, which grain bin you're going to, it'll go through those diverter tubes and then wh whichever one you have opened up, it'll, it'll feed from there and then go into the, go into the grain bin. Mo most elevators, uh, the grain bins we have are pretty similar to the, to the grain bins that the elevators have. Usually they just are, Quite a bit bigger, I guess. Okay. Are do you deliver most of your beans in that twenty to thirty mile 
um radio yeah, yeah we yeah um yeah it's 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 more of a convenience factor than anything else we we've occasionally hauled stuff down to the ohio river but but there has to be a pretty good premium on beans to to haul it down there because that's about 90 miles from our grain bin and and it takes uh takes quite a bit of fuel and time to to haul down there so yeah but just i would say well past couple years of 100 percent of our beans have been hauled within that 20 to 30 mile range and as far as where uh your beans end up um uh i assume that if you're growing commodity soybeans you're never quite sure some will stay in this country and some could go overseas once they're out of your hands uh, you're not totally sure where they go as you said many of them go to the carolinas for processing for feed right uh, now your non-gmo soybeans do you have an idea where uh those go yeah our, our yeah uh, and back to our commercial soybeans yeah the the two elevators that we haul to around here they they all go to the carolinas uh for feed and then our our non-gmo beans that we raise um the facility they go to they actually get loaded on um railroad containers uh sh shipping railroad shipping containers and they actually wound up in japan um they they previous to all the trade stuff going on uh they also ended up in china uh but but currently uh with with all the trade stuff they're they're actually um uh, most of those actually end up in japan and then the, uh, those will go for consumption as well in japan well since you brought up trade we have a uh, you just answered a couple questions that our group uh submitted here's one how does the current trade war with China and trade negotiations impact your marketing and decision making for this coming year? Yeah, it's it, it's it's always tough. You know, there's 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 never been a a lot of um, margin margin in in raising crops, but once once the trade war came on uh, or, or or took place, you know, there was there was a some pretty drastic. Um, uh the commodity price has really dropped uh, not not having china as as a trade partner has 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 hurt hurt not only ag but it, but all other all other several other aspects of of uh of the uh, businesses and trade and stuff that, that deal with that but it uh you know right right now we're we're pretty well just about breaking even is is what we're doing um you know depending on Depending on actually what we end up getting it sold for for the next year, but but there's you know there's there's a lot of people that have have you know that's that's why we store store our grain like we do that way if we if we get a run up in the markets that gives us an opportunity to to move them. But it's it, it, the margins are the margins were were tight before, but they're extremely tight now. So we're we're just right at break even on it. And trade is trade is vitally important. I mean it's it. Um, that's we, you know, we can always pr we can produce a large crop, but we've got to have somewhere to send it to and 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 uses for it. Yeah. Can would you mind getting out of the combine, Scott, if you could, and just show us? Uh, uh, we saw the animation. Real quickly, show us uh, the different parts of the combine so they can yeah. see it live. Yeah. Hang on a second, let me climb down and get everything adjusted here. Yeah, so this is our oops, I'm gonna run this thing. So this is our this is the combine that that we have. Um it's a it's a case international combine. And this is the this is actually the corn head that's on the front of it. This is not this is not what you cut soybeans with on it. So it actually enters. <clears throat> actually, here's what it looks like from the front on it. But it's it's same principle. The the corn will go go in through there and goes goes up through the goes up through the. Uh, feed your house which is right here and then goes 
goes on up into the machine and separates it out. And the, the thrust grain goes up in the grain tank that, uh, that I showed earlier. And then, um, and then the rest of it comes out of the, comes out of the back end of it. Right there's the, so that, those, those are called sieves there. And that's actually the, the grain goes down in between, in between those sieves. And then the, the rest of the material comes out, comes out of the back end and is spread by the, by the spreaders here on the back. So that's a, that's a real quick overview of it, I guess. Okay. I have some more questions for you. Okay. How many rows, how many rows of soybeans when you're harvesting soybeans, uh, can you harvest at one time? How many rows? Uh, it would be, well, we can do, we can do 40, we can do 40 foot. So uh, that you'd have to figure that out there in 15 inch rows. So I guess well, I'm not sure other than it'd be, other than it'd be 40 foot wide. Okay. Uh, so I, I could probably figure that out. Yeah, I, if you could do the calculations, Tom, that would help me. I don't have anything here with me to do it real quick. Well, 32, it says. That's yeah, that right? yeah, that would be right because it would be 16 rows of corn. So 32, 32 rows of beans. Yes, that would be correct. Okay. Uh, what, what has been your record year harvest yield-wise? Uh, for soybeans, our best year would have been uh, back in 2011. Uh, we averaged, uh, we were right close to 70 bushel that year, and that that's been our best. And our our worst was the drought of 2012, when they were they were uh, clear down in the low teens, 13, 14 bushel per acre. Yep. So you were talking about uh, you were talking about uh, trade earlier. Um, just to put it in perspective, before the tariffs were uh, put on uh, in 2018, one out of every three rows of U.S. soybeans went to China. Right. So that had, with losing the China market, had a big effect on uh, the soybean markets. And... Uh, we the soybean industry has been trying hard to diversify their markets over the last uh, year and a half because of that and finding new customers around the world now recently uh, china has been buying more soybeans right um, and uh, that's a good thing as a result the price has gone up a little bit mm -hmm. but still trade issues still are a big issue uh, for uh, farmers in Ohio and around the world. Yeah. Uh, the Ohio Soybean Council and the United Soybean Board and American Soybean Association, the United States Soybean Export Council all work together to build foreign markets because it's still a very high percentage of our soybeans go abroad, are exported. Mm -hmm. And I think we have some pictures of some folks that come to Ohio to see how our uh, soybeans are grown and, and uh, the quality of our soybeans and so forth. Uh, I believe that was a Chinese delegation. Now we're into a Japanese delegation, which brings me to a question we got from one of our uh, classrooms was uh, about non-GMO uh, versus GMO soybeans. Is there a big difference in the yield between your GMO and non-GMO soybeans? No, there's there's no difference at all. This year we had, you know, we we had both this year, and and, um, and both both yielded right there within one or two bushel of each other. So yeah, no no difference at all in in the yield of them. Yeah, I guess the big difference with non-GMO is you have to keep them separated from uh, GMO soybeans, uh, the customers demand that. Many of our non-GMO soybeans in Ohio are called food grade soybeans. Food grade soybeans are used for things like tofu, uh, soy milk, 
uh, those kinds of things. And our Japanese uh, customers and some other customers around the world like Ohio's non-GMO food grade soybeans. And as Scott said earlier, they are shipped by a container ship uh, to Asia. And they, their identity is preserved, protected, uh, so that when they arrive to the customer, they're exactly what the customer wants and they aren't mixed with uh, GMO. So yeah, that's... how you take care of non-GMO soybeans is a little different because uh, GMO soybeans are, you can't, uh, the pesticides and other uh, inputs you put on non on GMO soybeans you can't use on GMOs non GMO soybeans so uh, takes a little different management as a result the farmer gets paid a premium for doing those things uh, which is good for the farmer but it requires extra work so yeah so with our with our non GMO beans this year we we decided to combine those first um, we had to. We had to completely clean the combine out, completely clean the grain cart out, the semis, the uh, auger that we use to fill the bins and the grain bins. Um, they they are very nitpicky and make making sure that they get, you know, the non-GMO beans and make sure that there's no GMO beans in it in the in the sample. Um, so it it it's 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 a it's a little bit more management, but like Tom said. Um, with the two varieties we raised this year, the one variety we get a two dollar and twenty five cent premium, and the other one we get a dollar seventy five. So it's a it, the the premium amounts to to a pretty good to a pretty good amount. Um, you know over yeah over that's time. per bushel. So yeah, it's, yeah two dollars and twenty five cents and dollar seventy five per bushel. So and that, and when you were talking about trade earlier, you know when the when the trade when those when that went into effect in 18, um, you know, we were, we were in that $10 range in soybeans, mid $10 or something like that. And, and we pretty well lost a dollar 50 to dollar 75 to two bucks, depending on when you looked at it. Um, and that's, you know, in our operation alone, that, that was almost a hundred thousand dollar hit, um, just in our operation of, of, of income versus one year to the other. So it's, you know, it, 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 it the, the trade part, it, it, it's, it's been a pretty big deal. Speaking of your grain bin, this is another question from one of our classrooms. Uh, do you have to keep the grain bread bin at a certain temperature? Uh, when, when, we put the, when we put the beans in there, we'll, we'll most generally run the fans. Um, we'll run the fans. We'll run the fans when we're loading it to just to pretty much just blow the dust out of it. As, as we're, uh, as we're filling it, oh. let me get up in the combine. I get loud. Um, but yeah, so in the when we when we keep the beans in the bin, um, when it gets when the weather starts cooling off, uh, we'll actually we'll actually run the fans on bright sunny days, and um, we you know we'll have the we'll have the temperature inside the inside the bin of the beans. You know we like to have it what it is outside. Yeah. Uh, that way they that way it keeps well and stuff okay i think you answered this question earlier but again you grow as grow you grow pioneer and decal soybeans is that correct yeah, those are our commercial beans and then the the non-gmo beans are it's it's a company called bluegrass it's out of jeffersonville ohio and um uh our non-gmo beans are actually actually their own personal bluegrass variety were the ones okay. we raised this year and how how much does your combine? How much does a combine cost? Uh, a, a new machine is in that uh, three hundred and fifty thousand dollar range, and uh, the header the the header you use the, the a draper header that you cut beans with is in that hundred thousand dollar range. So, um, you know, when you're a combine and a corn head and a grain head, you're you're looking at uh, you're looking at somewhere around 600,000, 650,000 for, for all, for all three new. Yep. And you use them for how many weeks out of the year? Yeah. So we usually harvest, um, uh, six to eight weeks, uh, in the fall. And then since raising wheat and malt and barley, we'll run them, run them a week in the, 
in the summertime there that usually that usually takes care of that but yeah not used a lot and and um and i think it you know we pay those off in five-year notes too so it's it's not like a not like a not like a house or a commercial building or something like that where you've got a you know a longer period of time to take them off or to, to pay them off they're they're paid they're paid off relatively quickly on that Okay, well, we only have a few minutes left, so uh, if anybody wants to ask any more questions, please do. But why don't we talk a little bit about all the things that soybeans are used for? Um, so uh, why don't we go through that a little bit? We have some pictures to show you. So right, uh, like we had said earlier, uh, the soybeans they they get crushed and the and and um, the soybean mills used for used for livestock feed that that would be the that'd be one of the biggest uses of of soybeans um, for, for chickens pigs a uh, little bit little bit of cattle uh, another another big use would be a, a, another by, byproduct of it is is soy diesel uh, we actually run soy diesel in all of our equipment. Um, we're currently using the using a uh, ten percent blend, so so ten percent of our diesel fuel actually has biodiesel in it, uh, which which is a byproduct of the crushing process, and it's used used in paint as well on candles. There's uh, I don't Tom, you'd be able to tell me how many uses there are of soybeans. No, there are many uses in food, all varieties of food. Uh, adhesives, hand sanitizers, lubricants, um, uh, foam seats for Ford via Ford automobiles. Uh, as I said, food, it's used in a variety of foods, salad dressings, candy, uh, baking, and so forth. So uh, we're getting ready to wrap up, but we have a few more questions. It says here, what about soybeans supplied to food companies like Cargill, which processes soybeans right here in Ohio? Are those soy sourced from Ohio farms? Uh, I'll answer that one if it's okay, Scott. I think generally most of them probably come from Ohio, but yeah. the Cargill plant is over in Western Ohio, so I'm sure that they get beans from Indiana too, uh, but they have operations in Indiana. So I think it's where, whatever is most economical and closest for the, uh, for the farmer. Then yeah, that we haven't touched on this as much as we probably should, uh, but there are many careers associated not only with soybean farming, but with uh, uh, for agriculture in general, so we've touched on some of them. Uh, but you know, from people who develop the equipment for farmers, you have seed companies and fertilizer and uh, pesticide and herbicide companies. Uh, people who you know, technical people who work for them and marketing people. You have the grain handling and processing uh, business like Cargill and other elevators who market grain, buy grain, transport it all over the country and across the world. Uh, you have the transportation sector, trucking, uh, trains, uh, ships, transoceanic ships, shipping, uh, and then you have all the manufacturing of food and industrial products that are made from soybeans. So there are a wide variety of uh, career opportunities from uh, business related to farming itself to developing farm products, uh, highly technical engineering and scientific jobs, uh, overseas marketing and logistics opportunities, development of new foods and new products and so forth. So there, uh, there are a lot of things that can be done. Uh, I think we had one more question, but I'm not sure we have any more time. I apologize if, uh, if we didn't get your question answered, but uh, uh, we hope we answered most of your questions. We appreciate your time today. 
Uh, it's been our pleasure to come to your classroom. I want to thank Scott and Dan, our, our director producer today. And on behalf of Grow Next Gen and Ohio Soybean Farmers, thanks for joining us. We encourage you to go to the grownextgen.org website. There's lots of materials there for teachers, students, about careers and interesting things you can do in the classroom and all designed to help connect science to agriculture. So thank you very much for your participation. Uh, we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you, everybody have a good day.